What's up, people? Welcome to another episode of the Chatting in the City podcast, brought to you by the V-Track Lab at the University of Ottawa. Uh, the podcast itself is part of a larger project to investigate and explore mental health of Black youth, and it's funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And today I'm here with one of my old friends, a guy who inspires me, uh, one of the most driven and passionate people that I know, Abdullahi. What's happening, bro? How are you? My friend, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you, thank you for having me. No problem, G. All right, so I want to start off just asking you how, um, last time we spoke, I think it was in February, I was, you know, I was saying mm-hmm. congratulations, you've just been signed by Pacific FC. I was saying congratulations, man, I'm, proud. I'm so happy for you, I'm so proud of you. And then the virus happened, right? So everything had to close down. So I guess my first question is how, how has Pacific adapted to the coronavirus and obviously the CPL in general? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been kind of crazy, man, to be honest. When we talked, you know, I just signed. We were studying preseason. Right. Um, you know that exciting feeling in preseason when you're about to get the season <laughs> roll playing? Yeah. Um, obviously, my first contract as well. So I was just soaking everything in. And then uh, one day we're just at training and they're telling us uh, we're not training until, you know, a new word is is said. There's this thing called the coronavirus. And everyone's like, what's, what's that? Like, what's that? Um, so everyone's... <laughs> home everyone in quarantine and so we're just confused um and basically we we stayed home and at first we thought it was going to be two weeks ended up being what three four months uh of us just being uh home and uh in limbo honestly because as everyone else in other jobs uh we didn't know what, what was happening with this virus so we were home, we were giving uh, packages, uh, training packages, we were yeah. having workouts on Zoom, weekly conversations about tactics and stuff like that. Right. But very uncertain times, man. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of confusions, no, no words from, from the CPL at first, and everyone was just wondering what was gonna go on, to be honest. What about for you? Like we said, this, this is your first contract, your first season as, as a professional. And then, you know, you're obviously super excited to get started and you can't wait. And then this happens. Yeah. So for me, and you know, it's, it's crazy how to hear how everyone, uh, everyone's experiences with this is different for me. I think coming out of college, if I'm really honest with myself, Mm -hmm. I was not uh, fully ready for uh, uh, the professional environment and the demands. Um, So kind of to get that period of halt, was a was like a, a, a moment for me to see okay what I had just experienced with my first couple of weeks in training with in a professional environment, um, and it gave me actually time to work on on my craft right work on things that I think right. were still lacking in my game. Um, so people have suffered, and I don't want to talk, you know, because uh, as this being like a blessing in disguise because mm-hmm. it has done so much harm. Yeah. But for me, it gave me like a little room at least to, you know, be more still and uh, focus on, on what it means to be a pro, my habits, uh, and so so on and so forth. Yeah, like oddly enough, it's obviously like you just said, it's a, it's a virus and people are dying, people are losing their jobs, but like it kind of like weirdly enough, it felt like for everybody, there was like a moment to just breathe, right? Everything Absolutely. just paused, it was like, okay, what's going on? Where are we going? What are we doing? You know, people started figuring out what maybe some of the things you weren't doing aren't right. So maybe you should try to switch things. So, yes, it was a blessing. Well, it was a curse and obviously somewhat a blessing. Um, but I'm just, I was just trying to think of, because I was thinking about you and like, it's your first season. You're about to get started. You're ready to go. And then nothing, absolutely no mm-hmm. games happening, no training, nothing, nothing. So then what did you guys do? Because I know some of the leagues, obviously the Bundesliga came back, EPO came back as well, stuff like that. What did you, what have you guys been doing? Yeah, so right now, actually, I'm in Prince Edward's Island, and the league has started back um, NBA style, MLS style, in a bubble. So all the teams are here, you know, uh, <laughs> and we're just competing in a virtual stadium. So wow. it's, been, it's been all the rage, man. It's been from doing nothing, absolutely nothing, um, being in self-isolation to starting mm-hmm. training in small groups. And now being in a, in an environment where you're playing all the teams like at a fast rate, you know, it's like, it's it's crazy, man. So that's kind of my situation right now. Uh, when El Prince Edwards Island for this tournament, forty five days or whatnot. Have you noticed the difference 
in like playing, obviously you played at Michigan, it's a big college. You had a lot of fans there when you were playing. And now you're playing in a stadium where there's no one, right? You, you know, you guys are having the island games, you know, it's what they're calling it. There's no, mm-hmm. there are no fans. It's just the players, obviously the staff and that's it. Have you noticed a difference in terms of, and how, how has that affected you playing? It's just, it's kind of like when we were kids, there's nobody there essentially. We just, it's just you against the other team. That's it. Yeah. So I would say, well, first, you know, uh, as a new pro and stuff, I'm, I'm fighting to get minutes, obviously in my mm. position, especially it's difficult to break through. And so fighting to get minutes, I actually got my, my first, you know, few minutes, uh, two games ago or whatnot, I came on for like nice. 30 seconds at the end. <laughs> hey, you got to start Congrats, somewhere. Congrats, bro. You know? Congrats. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, the difference, I would say, um, maybe some people would expect the desire and the motivation to be less because mm-hmm. uh, there are no fans there. I think perhaps for people or leagues that are more established and where players, you know, are making – uh, uh, have bigger contracts and stuff, that might be a factor. But for okay. us, you know, I think in a smaller league like this, every game matters not only for the clubs, um, but for the individuals. You're fighting for your contracts. You're fighting for, um, you know, for a lot of people, it's a lot of options, short-term contracts. And, you know, I'm. Right. you already know, bro. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm not sure you're anything to you. I'm telling you the real, like, people are going to say, yes, I'm giving you the straight answers. Mm. Uh, I think people always feel that pressure um, because you you want to play this game and and getting paid to play this game is tough. So uh, whether there's fans or not, you still have that huge pressure of performance and of winning games. Some guys have like just also bonuses for, you know, wins, uh, clean yeah. sheets. So I think maybe the, the, the fans add that uh, – maybe added some elements of like just being more dynamic and lively, but in terms of the pressure to perform and to win, uh, it's always there from what I've seen so far. Yeah. I'm, I'm only asking because uh, when the Bundesliga came back, stadiums were empty and I actually, mm-hmm. I, I feel like, I think I liked that more because I could hear what the players were saying. Right. Mm-hmm. I could hear what they were saying. It, it felt like the players were playing just like you said, purely to win, purely for their contracts, purely, it, 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 it's almost like everything was stripped away. All this, you know, the fan, all the fun stuff yes. was stripped away. It's like, we're back to the game now. This is what we do. Uh, this is what we do. We're here to play. That's it. I uh, Absolutely. No, you're, you're spot on with that, man. You're spot on. And even I'm sure you saw with the Champions League and the different competitions. Yeah. It's not like players score and they're, you know, you see the passion. You see how much it means to them. Like, if you love this game and you're pushing to play at this level, like, winning and, and and performing still has that same effect on you regardless of if uh, everyone is watching or or if you're playing in the backyard with your friends you still have that yeah exactly yeah man all right um i want to take us back a little bit because i've always i guess i wanted to ask you these questions but i guess i never got the chance and that was the perfect chance when you moved from ottawa to montreal to impact right mm-hmm. what was that like for you what was the change like for you because obviously you moved from home and then you were you know basically in a professional environment and you were living there full time. So what was, what was the adjustment period for you? Like, and how, do, how do you feel like that affected you? Mm-hmm. Man, I think that, that, that uh, move shaped me like in every way, the person I am, because uh, I moved, I was 16. Mm-hmm. And for the first couple months I went to high school there and I right. was playing. But after that, you know, the systems in Quebec and uh, Ontario are different, the school systems. And I still wanted to stay on track with like the Ontario system because of like maybe I was already thinking maybe college opportunities or stuff like that. So I told my mom like, okay, and I didn't, to be honest, the place I was at, I didn't like it. I didn't like the atmosphere of the school Mm -hmm. I was in uh, too much. So I told my mom like, yo, I'm doing school online from now on. So between grade 10, 10 to 12th grade, I did online. So Mm -hmm. Basically, um, I think that shaped me like crazy because, you know, at that point it was like, I'm living on my own. Uh, every decision that I make, uh, I have to make. Uh, no one's going to, you know, babysit me or right. tell me to sleep there at one, one time, eat, eat this, eat that. Uh, I have to be mature. I have to do my schoolwork. No one's supervising me for anything. Mm, yeah. My only responsibility is going to training. 
and even that, right? You understand the pressure. I know, bro. A performance, even then, like, yeah. if you're not playing well, like, you're gonna get six months, and they're gonna cut you. So, managing all of these kind of made me, I think, shape me into being so independent. Really, like, really think, not relying on anyone, and mm -hmm. kind of having that attitude. Um, and I love that we're gonna tie it in, into the uh, uh, concept of mental health, especially because. Growing up, then I realized so, some of these habits were super unhealthy, right? Mm. So, I'm I'm asking because obviously this is a podcast about mental health, and there was um there was a researcher I think it was at Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, his name was Bruce K Alexander I think he's retired now and he he put he kind of put forward this theory called dislocation theory, and it was based off the fact that when people move away from their home environment, move away from their family, right? Obviously for work or school, whatever it may be their mental health suffers, right? Mm. Most of the time it tends to suffer. So I was just wondering if that happened to you as well, because the way he figured it out was they were looking at, um, he was looking at addiction habits, right? Which is sort of like a, something that comes off of mental health. Um, he was looking at rats. So he had rats in two different conditions. So he had uh, some rats that had, were in, in their home environment. So they had their family with them. They had play structures where they could, you know, have fun, exercise and stuff like that. And they had rats that were, didn't have their families with them, no friends, no family, right? Just nothing. And he wanted to see which ones, which rats would be more likely to obviously suffer. And then which would always which would be more likely to be addicted to drugs. And he found that the, the rats that were alone in a very sparse environment without friends, without family, were much more likely to get addicted. And he sort of took that and applied it to, you know, just generally speaking in the world that when people tend to move away from their family and sort of move away from their home base, they tend to, you know, obviously the anxiety, depression tends to increase and he linked to back to back in the day in uh, the industrial revolution, when people started moving from like the small, small towns to big cities, being away from their families. And, you know, the kind of, they saw a rise in mental health problems and all that stuff. So I was just wondering if any of that affected you moving from, obviously you said you're 16, like we were kids, right? You're 16 and you move to impact. You're there, you're alone. You have to do your schoolwork by yourself. Make sure you get to mm -hmm. training on time. Make sure you sleep right, eat right, do everything. Yeah, man, I would definitely say like, I would say the good times and, 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 you know, when I was like around, I had I was privileged to still uh, be living with teammates and guys that I consider like family now, you know, so mm -hmm. I think that kind of supported me throughout the right. way and the club also was great for that. But I think definitely the tough times were really tough, you know, when you when things are not going your way in training and stuff and you come home and you're just by yourself, like there's no one, you, maybe you call you, you have someone to call, but it's just different than being like in your household yeah. with your parents. So I would say um, for sure, like sometimes I think we're really rough. Mm. Um, it's, t it's tough for me to say like uh, in hindsight, you know, if that's uh, bad or good to go through these things, because obviously, as I said to you, they shaped me and, Mm. And like, since I'm where I am now, and I'm pretty happy with where I am, right. it's tough to say, okay, well, that was detrimental or good, but definitely the tough times were really rough. And I would say, um, maybe Ottawa to Montreal is not that much of a of a crazy transition because like kind of cultures are the same. Right. My mom is still close; she can come visit, you know, and stuff. Bring me some rice, you know. <laughs> So that's, <laughs> bro, so, you know, that's still, that's still good. I'm two yeah. hours away from a proper African meal. Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but when I went to Michigan, man, uh, like, that was like 360 cultural shift. Like, I could not really understand how people thought at first. Like, it's so different, right? And also, there was so little diversity compared mm. to... Uh, the melting pot we have in Ottawa and Montreal, Montreal yeah. that it was like, that I would say was really challenging. When I yeah. went to that environment, I was like, yo, what's this, man? That was, that, that was my next question. Because, I mean, I wanted to get your thoughts on moving from Ottawa to Montreal and then moving from, obviously, Montreal to Michigan for college, right? Mm -hmm. I, was, I, just, I was wondering, like, was the adjustment different? Obviously, you said it was a lot rough. It was a lot harder because it was just such a different place, different climate, different culture. In Michigan. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. I think like going to the States was something like, again, another experience that in hindsight, I'm you know, one of the probably the most amazing experience that four year, three years mm. and a half uh, studying there with the amount of like knowledge I got, the right. people I've met, you know, 
the things I've seen, the experiences, but it was definitely like a rough, uh, it was rough a, a lot of times because like, like you said, the, the community was different, you know, um, I didn't have, I feel like people that I was like so close to except one or two. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think like just also the, the classes are different there. Like, um, obviously it's a big school, you know, like socioeconomically, like the people that I was around mostly were from other, you know, paths of life. And a lot of times it made me feel like I didn't have, I couldn't relate to their experiences or, you know, right. like I was just like very different from them. So I think that was, that was challenging for sure, to be honest. Michigan. Cause I mean, I, I had the chance to also go away for college to play footy, but Mm-hmm. In the end, I decided not to go. But I guess, like, okay. looking back, looking back for me. So I had a chance to go to Cape Breton to play for Cape Breton mm-hmm. University. And obviously, they were, you know, youth sports finalists, like, last year or year before. They did, they're, yeah. they're a really good team. But I had a chance to go. And obviously, for several reasons, I decided not to go. But I've always felt like moving away for something like undergrad is just not the best idea because you're still trying to get your footing in university at least mm. trying to get your footing figure out you know what you what your schedule is going to be like for classes for classes sports making sure you do your homework all that stuff so i just felt like moving over would not be the best option mm-hmm. so i ended up not doing it but obviously you did it and you went to a different country that's that's something you know that's just <sighs> yeah man honestly there's a lot there's i i won't lie like again with how much I love the experience, there was a lot of times I was like, yo, what am I doing here? Like, you know, like this is a, this is a different world I'm in. Like feel alone and stuff mm-hmm. and, and don't really know how to address or, or think about it. It's amazing now, just even in like the, the couple years now that, um, that I've been through college and stuff, the conversations about mental health, uh, right. and, and kind of like how awareness is being brought, uh, to everyone now it's amazing because I don't remember when even when I was like in Montreal and stuff ever even thinking about it like that or if I did honestly just being straight on it if I did I would have thought that's soft yeah I thought that, yeah. that's soft uh, yeah. and that's like a common I guess I'm sure you 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 hear a lot of this and and it, it, with with this kind of um, with this movement it's like the the preconceived notions we have at first of what it is are so like they're they're so wrong right yeah yeah but i was gonna ask you actually do you feel like which i think you've kind of answered do you feel like there's stigmas regarding mental health in sports oh hell yeah man Mm. like (laughs) oh come on now like (laughs) i mean i know the answer but like i'm only asking because you know (laughs) this is a part and we gotta you know yeah absolutely like a hundred thousand percent and that's something you know that I'm thinking a lot about even now, like it's so hard to reconcile these two things, right? Like mm. on one end, being tough, being brave, um, um, uh, willingness to win and to endure like difficulties and to come out on top. Yeah. Um, and on the other end, like, you know, like all these emotions that are affecting your life, affecting your day to day. You know, it's so tough to think of these things because even you know i'm 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 curious to get your opinion on this too because we see kind of the the michael jordan documentary and stuff like that yeah yeah and i'm sure you saw it bro and the thing that resonates with everyone is like oh like um he always wants to like he's always pushing his teammates to like the breaking point himself to the breaking point Mm -hmm. taking things personally um just to get like that edge that competitive edge right and it's like okay where where do you find that balance yeah michael uh the documentary the last dance i watched it obviously and I, you know i was talking about it with some friends and what i feel about michael jordan obviously he's the gold he's the greatest of all time everybody knows that i don't think anybody denies it and i think personally for me looking at him he was a very he made up things in his mind just so he could get the edge, right? Making up, you know, somebody walks in, like, he tells a story about somebody walking into the <laughs> restaurant and not saying hello to him. And that just absolutely was like, all right, you ain't gonna say hello to me? All right, I'm gonna see you on the court. It was like, it's just, he, he, had, he had to make up things to keep going, keep himself going. But I don't feel like that helped him because when he retired, I don't think he was able to turn it off, right? Hmm. That's the hard thing. It's like, how do you 
perform at that high level, stay up there. And then when you retire, just bring yourself down. It's mm. very different, especially the way he was doing, I feel like. And so that's why, like one of the saddest things in the documentary is um, watching him in present time with his, you know, he's, he's got his drink, he's got his cigar and his eyes are like brown. And it's just, it looks like yeah, he's not man. sleeping. It looks like he's not, you know, taking care of himself. It was just, I mean, maybe that's the, maybe that's the price of greatness, but I also don't think it has to be that. Mm. Mm, yeah, at what cost? Like greatness at what cost, right? Like that's a, I honestly, that's something I've been asking myself uh, lately. Greatness is at what cost? And sadly, you know, like again, with black athletes, black males, like you're only seen as something if you're, if you're victorious, like, yeah. like if you win and if you're like performing, then it feels like you're getting, people are valuing you. But then at the cost of like your, your sanity almost at times, man. So, ah, you know, it's tough. It's tough for me to, to figure out kind of even the best way for me to go about this, you know, like I want to be great in this thing. I want right. to push my career to the max. Um, and, you know, how do I balance that with, you know, with being kind of like uh, living properly, not being uh, obsessive and yeah. things like that, bro. It's hard. It's a hard question because in a way you have to be obsessive to get through, you know, to get to the professional level, right? You have to be dedicated and make sure you do everything right. Right. That's the obsession. And then to get to that level. And then once you get to that level, you have to keep it going because just getting there is not enough. You have to keep getting better and better and better. Right. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's really tough because you have to think about, even if you play in the sports for, let's say 10, 15, 20 years, it's like, you're still going to have to retire and live a life after that. Mm -hmm. So then, like you said, at what cost, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, and I, I, I want to ask you something uh, that relates to this. What is, like, what is the price of winning to you? Like, what's the cost of winning? Like, do you, are you one of those people who are like, I must win at all costs? Or is it more nuanced for you? I think I definitely used to be. I used to be. Okay. Um, that kind of mad about it, I guess where it was like, it's like, there's no other way for me, like not winning necessarily, but achieving, you know, like pursuing my ambition. And, you know, like, even when I was 12, 13, I remember like thinking like this, you know, like I would pass the ball on the wall and be like, Yo, there's no way in, like I got to make it. There's no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I have to. And I think growing up, like, college was a real uh, I was really fortunate uh, to go to college it, it enabled me to explore my other interests mm -hmm. and um I remember vividly a moment man in in uh between like my my before my senior year where I was like thinking like I gotta make this happen like this is my last year I got yeah. you know I have to to show everything this is my last chance and I was just like psyching myself out over it and then like I had moments where I just realized, honestly, that whether or not, like, I do this thing, I can, I'll be happy. I'll be mm. happy, like, um, and I think that's a real privilege uh, that I have, uh, having the chance to go through college and, and exploring other interests because, you know, and my team and stuff, like, or in other professional teams, like, you see guys that have dedicated everything to this. That's the only thing they know. That's the only way they know how to make money. Right. Um, that's their skill, you know, like, that's their skill. Yeah. People don't think about that enough. Like when they think, oh, athletes, like, yeah, like they're making money, like, yo, how, uh, what kind of lifestyle they're living. That's their skill. That's the one of, most of them is the only thing they have as a skill to sell yeah. um, and to add value. So for me to, to be able to think now that nah, like I have other things I can offer and other things that I'm interested in, I think that's kind of like, um, uh, that's a, just a, I'm, a benefit that I have now that's changing the way I play and the way I approach the game, honestly. Yeah, that's great to hear because, I mean, I feel like you and I growing up, I think we're on the same mentality of we're going in, we're all in, we're here for the win. That's yeah. that's kind of what we're yeah. all about. And I feel like over time I've gotten to the point, to the place where I'm more like, okay, if we play a team that's, you know, better than us and we lose or we gave it our all, you know, it is what it is. We lost. I'll be, you know, I'll be, I'll be upset, but it's like, it's not the end of the world. The thing that gets me is playing a team that's at our level or just slightly below and we lose because we didn't, you know, mm. we didn't do our best. Oh, that sends mm. me into a, 
<laughs> I'm like, I'm in a different place for the next hour. But then like after that, I just, I'm just like, yeah, the game's over. All right, it is what it is. Who cares? Yeah. But it's taking time to get there. And uh, I'm happy, I guess I'm here as well. But it's just, oh my God. I, yeah, I, just, I, mean, I don't know. The, hey, the, bro, the competitive mindset never really goes, man. It's, it's just how it's in your, in your veins, man. I know how you are. I can never forget. Yo, know, these games, man, it, we just be, we just be so angry. We just be so, so angry. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Oh. But yeah, um, I, I want to ask you about uh, getting to Michigan. So when you got to Michigan, mm-hmm. you said it was, you know, culture change, some sort of culture shock. It was so different there. Did you have people that you could talk to in terms of, you know, like somebody with the team or affiliated with the team to talk talk them about, you know your adjustment, how you're doing, you know, how you're not necessarily feeling like you're fitting in. Was there a person there that you could go to? Yeah, so I found my person, like, um, they were always telling us about these resources and stuff. Um, But again, like, what we talked about earlier, when I heard, like, counseling and support and stuff like that, I was like, yo, no chance, no way in the hell, like, that's (laughs) soft. Like, what is that? Like, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know? And it's only later in college when I guess I went through things, I matured and I, I, I got to know like someone who worked, worked with like the, the mental health for athletes kind of committee there. Okay. Um, uh, I got to know him a little bit and I saw that, yo, like it doesn't have to be like, like, hey, sir, like oh, sit down in this long chair and you know, like this yeah. kind of. <laughs> yeah, the, the cartoonish I, therapist thing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and oh, doctor, like I'm suffering. Like, oh, like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be like that. Like it can just be like this guy was a cool guy. He's still to still now, Mr. Moore. I talked to him like he's just like a mentor even. So right. conversations can be like natural, just like you and I would have now. You know, mm. not not something that's like so rigid and feels like I'm I'm a I'm a victim or I'm you know I'm struggling. Right. Uh, I I think understanding that for me was what made me wanna kind of do these things i guess okay so i guess he was someone who just like made you feel comfortable to talk about whatever so you know that makes sense because like you were just making a joke about the you know the cartoonish therapist lay down in the chair you know <laughs> cry your heart out it's not necessarily it doesn't have to be that you can just have somebody talk to it could be a family member it could be like you said the per, you know a mentor that you found in michigan you know it doesn't have to be the you know the cartoonish thing um, yeah, I have some questions here for you. We're coming up against it. Uh, you know, some quick questions. Uh, one of them is, give me three things that you absolutely cannot live without. Hmm, like things, just things, like whatever it material is. Material, material, what material? <laughs> it's whatever, bro. Mm. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, oh, hey. I have one for the A, hey, for the t- but specific to the time, huh? <laughs> for those who are listening, this guy just put on a mask. That's funny. <laughs> Bro, I can't live without that, huh? I have to wear a mask. No, you can't. <laughs> All right, so um, one no. mask. Okay, okay. <laughs> now I'm trying to think, look around me, like, see really what I... Uh, I think... It's hard for me to think really that there's things that I can't live without, honestly, okay. you know. I asked, uh, I asked, uh, I had my cousin on, on the first episode of this and I was asking him and he gave, um, uh, I think he said family. He said, no, 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 It was, so it was three things you can't, that you can't live without. So essentially three things, if you were stuck on an island, three things that you would need. Uh, so his answer okay. was, his answer was he needs his phone. <laughs> That's why <laughs> he wanted his phone. He wanted a boat, and then he wanted something else. I can't remember, because he said he, if he had a boat, he'd go sh- he'd go fishing, and then he could just leave the island, right? <laughs> so I'm wondering yeah. if you're stuck on an island. What do you? Three things. Oh, um, my Kindle, my Kindle. All so right, I can Respect. read some books and stuff. Um, uh, uh, a phone with only my I only need my mom's number. That's good, you know, <laughs> so I can call my mom, talk to her. Be good. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'll never forget. I will never, ever, ever forget this. Alele on it. 
<laughs> Never. That's in my head, just playing on a loop. Your mom is the greatest, <laughs> man. Your mom is the greatest. It's just... She's the best. I, I forgot about that. Ali Leonette. Oh my God, bro. Yo, this, nah, that's too funny. It's hard. <laughs> and then maybe a third thing, like, hmm, maybe, huh, yeah, maybe, I like to make music, like, just uh, in my in my downtime, you know, so maybe if I could have a okay. computer with my headphones, obviously that, then I need to something, somewhere to plug in and shit, so it becomes complicated, so, oh, I know, I know, I know, bro, I know. I'll get a, a little banjo or something. So that's perfect. Yeah, it. you can make strings. You can make the thing. Yeah, that's perfect. 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 Wow. I think the last time I said, I said I would need a ball or just something to, you know, keep me keep me occupied. Something to play with. So some sort of mm. soccer ball, basketball, whatever it is. And then I wanted, uh, I wanted a clean source of water. And then I wanted mm. something else. But I can't remember now. But that's whatever. Um, you mentioned a Kindle. Uh, are there... Like, what's the, is there a book that you recommend? Something you've read recently? Oh, let me go on my channel and see. I All read right. very, like, um, uh, sporadically, like, I like, I don't really read uh, uh, front to back or stuff like that. Just, like, okay. if I feel like diving into a book or a subject, I read a bit and then. Oh, a book that, uh, that's, like, my, my, one of my favorites of all time is The Power of Now. I could call it. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this. The, the Power of Now, it's called. I recognize the name, but I've never heard of the book. I'll look it up. I'll write it down. Yes, man. The, this book is just amazing to me. Um, speaks about um, just uh, if I need to kind of boil it down very simply, just being the idea of being present and, mm. and kind of like approaching life mindfully moment to moment. Right, right. Um, that's kind of like that's a thing I just I just live by these these principles this philosophy. Um, it's also something that's it's sort of it's come back. I mean, it used to be you know the whole meditation back in the day, but it's sort of come back mindfulness, being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like you, you know, that's what the book is about, I assume. And yeah, like that's come back like the last five years, I guess. It's really it's really popular now. Just trying to be present because <clears throat> weirdly enough, we live, we live in a time when. I think we're all sucked into whatever may be our different screens, your laptop, your whatever gets sucked into like a different world. And you're not necessarily paying attention to what's going on around you. So being yeah, mindful of what's uh, yeah. happening is really important. Which, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, it can be hard because, you know, it, meditation in a way is trying to like clear your mind. And that's so hard. But just try to be, just try to be mindful of what's happening around you. Is, it's, it's a good start. Yeah, man. And for me, meditation, honestly, like, it's not even clearing my mind, but just being aware of what's going on in there, you know, like right. just seeing the thoughts and kind of like, okay, seeing my patterns and everything that goes into my head. That's kind of like how I see it. Never to control, just to observe, to observe internally what's going on, what's, what's going around and externally as well to, to try to like look without judgment at others, at, at just everyone. So that book really to me, um, big time and like you say the meditation practice and just yeah. awareness um what else do i have here what I do like? oh mastery by robert green that's oh. just uh, i also recognize the name robert green but i haven't robert heard of the green, book robert green wrote the 48 laws of power uh, ah, so that's probably that's where it. you recognize the name yeah um, the book's right there yeah uh, my, my, it's my dad's book. It's my dad's book. Is out here reading about you know management, power, mm. stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah. So that book in the Forty Laws of Power, it doesn't really resonate with me. But mastery, really, like he's he's looking at different mass people that have mastered their crafts mm. across time, um, great artists, great musicians, and he tries to find the parallels and mm. kind of like boil down the the things that one needs to to think about if like striving for mastery and stuff so i i try to, to, to take these things and see how they apply to me honing my skills and keep growing into my game right, right? um yeah, okay yeah man so yeah these are the two right now i would say like okay so robert right green now. mastery and eckhart tolle the power of now the power of now yeah right. man all right i'll look into them 
Um, what about you, man? Tell me about some. Bro, the last, I just finished reading this book called The Tenth Man. It's about, um, it's about Nazi occupied France, World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about a guy who he's in prison, right? He's been, you know, he's one of the French people. He was a lawyer. He was, he was in prison by the Nazis, but then he, um, for some reason, the, the guards wanted to essentially kill a person like every, every month or something like that. And there were 30, 30 prisoners in the prison. And so they had to decide uh, one person out of 10 people. So that's a total of three people, right? Because they're 30 people. So then what they did was they, uh, they decided to like draw, draw sticks essentially, right? To see who would, you know, who would have to, you know, go, who would have to stay. And this lawyer picks, you know, the bad stick that says, you know, you have to be put to death. And he, 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 uh, he tells everybody that, hey, if somebody's willing to take this, I will give them my, my estate, all my money or whatever. He was rich. Mm. Somebody ends up taking, you know, he's like, you know what, I'll take it, right? And then the story kind of follows the lawyer after all, the, all that has happened and the war is over as, you know, he's trying to get back home, find his family, stuff like that. It's a really interesting book. Wow, um, that sounds incredible. Yeah, it's also, it's a really quick read. Like, it's not a long book, but it's really, 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 really good. Um, and then another book I read, which it's a little, this one is like 500 pages. It's a big one. Uh, the Master and the Emissary. It's basically about um, the brain, and how, you know, the divided brain, how the right hemisphere relates to the left hemisphere. And it's, it's a little, it's a little dense, but it's really, it's probably the best thing I've ever read. So that's wow, really? out there. Yeah. Because the wow. guy, the guy who wrote it essentially relates the development of the brain and the fact that the brain is divided to how the Western world has developed. So he goes back to you know, like ancient Greece and up, up until the modern age, essentially. So sort of, hmm. and like relates how the brain has developed and to how different modes of you know being within the hemispheres have affected the world and to the point that hmm. we are now. It's really, really, really interesting. But it's obviously like if you don't have the time, it's five hundred pages long. It's not, you know. Still that sounds incredible in terms of yeah. so it just goes through the development of the or just the, the structure of the brain. So basically it's it, two parts. Part one, structure of the brain, right? And he explains why the brain is actually, you know, what the two hemispheres, because the brain is, you know, one mass, but it's mm. divided, right? So you have two hemispheres. So he mm -hmm. talks about why the brain, first of all, why would the brain be divided? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you not have just one thing working together, right? Coherent, which it does work together, but it's divided. So he explains why it's divided. And then he goes into how that, division happened over time and how it relates to the development of the western world it's really it's yeah it's it's amazing it's, it's the best thing i've read so far so it's yeah. well, i'm looking to that honestly that sounds if that you sounds can if you crazy. can just read a page a day it's you'll get it done um and the last question is there like some unexpected fact about you that people don't generally know because i have one about mm. me and it's uh <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny when I was really really young I um I was playing with friends and then I think I fell uh I cut myself like my upper thigh so I mm -hmm. couldn't wear shorts and so I wore a skirt for like three months as I was <laughs> as I was healing so it's like nobody really knows that my parents obviously my parents know that because they made me wear the thing but <laughs> it was funny I was okay, getting yeah. roasted <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was getting roasted. Uh, oh man, I guess uh, what like like fun or whatever funny fact about me maybe is uh, my second name is Gilbert, right? Like my first name, <laughs> my first name Abdullah. That's so in my in my like uh, in Mali, basically the first son of the family gets the son of the grandfather. So uh, uh, my name Abdullah. That's my grandfather's name. But then right. my grandfather from Belgium, he was like, "Yo, like, what's good?" You know. I so want to give you a name too. <laughs> yeah. So my second name is Gilbert. And when I was like in uh in like uh like kindergarten and like first grade, whatever uh, these when I was young uh, mm -hmm. like you, uh, I was like people could never pronounce my name. So I was so like so embarrassed i was just like before the teacher would ever say my name like even substitute teacher at the beginning i was like oh call me gilbert call me gilbert like because I, <laughs> I was so embarrassed you know but then, uh, then that's I hilarious <laughs> that's funny oh yeah but i don't share that one often wow. bro, just for you my guy 
just for you that one. I appreciate it, man. Oh my god, that's <laughs> funny. Gilbert, I never would have expected it. Never. No one does. No one does. That's why uh, if I say it, people just laugh. So uh, like, if you told me, like if you told me otherwise, if we were just hanging out, and you told me I'd be like, no, you're lying. That's what you're, you're playing me right now. You're you. That's cap. That's just no, 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 no. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, man. People don't never see that one coming, honestly. They never do. Anyway, brother, thank you so much for talking to me. I know, you know, there's a tournament going on. You're busy. You need to get your sleep. Uh, so I'm going to have to let you go. Thank you so much again. I appreciate you. Take care of yourself. Much love, bro. And, hey, um, before we go, before we go, how are you doing, bro? Oh, you know, you asked me all these thank questions. You, thank you. you I'm good, man. Questions. I'm good. I'm good. Um, doing, summer's going well. Obviously, summer's just finished, but... Uh, it was a good summer. A lot of work, busy, but it was really good. Yeah. I'm starting school, so uh, that's going to be a lot of fun online. Mm. So, oh. Yeah. It's going to be interesting, huh? It is going to be interesting. But yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you for asking, man. I appreciate that. Oh, man, of course. Get yourself a nice Zoom background for when <laughs> school starts. So you can come in style. You know, you, start, yo, you, you know that feeling, bro. You come the first day you have your, you have your swag. Now you got to come the first day with the fresh zoom background yeah i'm yeah, not doing right. that bro i'm not doing that i'm not gonna be one of those people like with all the books you know just <laughs> books everywhere nah bro that's too much. Yo, I have a good, uh, get the island at the back bro the <laughs> desert island like this <laughs> i'm not doing any of that bro i'm not doing any of that anyway everybody thank you for listening it's been an episode of the chatting in the city podcast with one of my best friends abdu thank you for listening my guy Boys, bro, hey, let me let me see that zoom background when you got it, bro. I'll find one for you, fam. I'll find one for you. All right, man. All right, bro. <laughs>